Well, good morning, everyone, and pleasure having you at uh, our grand rounds. Um, today is very special to us. Um, we have Dr. Leslie Shaw, who will be giving grand rounds on cardiac risk. Uh, Dr. Shaw does not need any introduction. Uh, she is really one of the pioneers in imaging, cardiac imaging, and uh, has really made her mark over the years in so many areas. She's currently in New York. Uh, she's discovering this uh, over the past few months because uh, really the base of most of her work and where her base was with at Emory in Atlanta, where uh, she really delved into all areas of cardiovascular imaging, particularly looking at not only accuracy and diagnosis, outcome, uh, diversity of utilization, impact, cost effectiveness, you name it, in all the fields. And uh, just like uh, also the field has evolved over the years, it was nuclear cardiology at the beginning, and more recently, cardiac CT, where uh, even combining these two mod modalities have been uh, really phenomenal from our not only diagnostics, but also therapeutics and outcome and outlook for patients. Uh, she headed the Clinical Cardiovascular Research Institute at Emory. And uh, she is amazingly, incredibly published with more than almost 700 publications cited to be among the percentile of researchers who are quoted uh, worldwide. And uh, I think this is an attestation to what really has, uh, she has done for the field and all her contributions. Many awards, uh, the Simon Deck uh, Academic uh, Excellence Award from the American College of Cardiology the Coalition to Reduce Disparities in Cardiovascular Disease Outcomes Award, the Women's Day Red uh, Dress Award, and uh, the Albert uh, Levy Scientific Research Award, among actually many. Uh, closer to our heart, she uh, was actually the lecturer for Mario Venani's lecture at the ASNIC a few years ago, and she recently received the gold medal uh, from the Society of Cardiovascular Computed uh, Tomography, SCCT. Um, I've known her well over the years. Actually, we had one publication on cost effectiveness, but um, I hear her voice and she hears my voice every week when we are on the Jack Imaging um, editorial uh, uh, board. And she's the executive editor, actually, of Jack Cardiovascular Imaging. And uh, she is unique in a way that she was uh, the president of both societies, ASNEC as well as cardiovascular CT, uh, somebody that um, has no match because no other person actually has headed both institutions. So it's really a pleasure uh, welcoming uh, Leslie uh, to, our, uh, to our campus here. And she will be addressing cardiovascular risk. I know she may concentrate on CT. I don't know how she's going to look at it, but we look forward to your presentation. Leslie, great to have you. Thank you all. Thanks for um, coming to work a little early, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I've known uh, many of the folks here for, for a very long time, Dr. Mamarian, uh, Dr. Zogby, Dr. Almala, who I'm, um, you're, you are lucky to have here. So um, it's really exciting for me to be here. So when, um, when you all asked me to talk about cardiac risk, um, I thought it would be a great idea for me to use a more clinical example than to just go a, a more population-based, epi-based. So that is why I decided to use the concept of, of a cardiac CT. Maybe, yeah, yeah, we go, okay. So um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on using the example, but I'm gonna start off a little bit in just understanding what, what we need to understand from a cardiac risk point of view. So first of all, when we think about healthcare quality and improving outcomes, absolutely this is why you show up every day to work, is that you wanna improve every patient's outcome. The paradigm from a risk assessment point of view is that you detect risk, and then you identify those patients who are at risk for targeted treatments, and those treatments are known to be effective and improve patient outcomes. This is this circle of life, if you will, this cycle of, of care that you all do every day. And so this illustrates the concept 
of risk assessment as, as to how it fits within what you do every day. So understanding risk, understanding targeted treatments, and therefore understanding patient outcomes. And this is why I thought I, the, the example of coronary CT angiography fits very well with this, because it is an example that I can actually take around that whole circle and show you improved outcomes with coronary CT angiography, the first non-invasive modality which has been established to show this. And really, we go from this concept of discovery science. You see a paper that really illustrates interesting concepts, and here's some data that we have from a project uh, that we're doing with medical examiners on sudden cardiac death with CT, and we're looking at trying to develop plaque signatures, you know, the usual stuff that we'll talk about a little bit later. This is this discovery science on what we see from a pathobiologic point of view, understanding the role of, of any modality in both prognos prognosis and effectiveness, but ultimately we have to make that step into care coordination. And this is where most modalities get, get stuck, is what do we do with a piece of information? It's novel, it's reflective of risk, but then how do we actually target treatment? And of course, this step is critical to improving patient outcomes. And this is gonna be, this is gonna be the focus of the, the talk today. Uh, one of the key components to understanding risk is to understanding that there is a variable quality in the levels of evidence. Here's a statement from the American Heart Association was published in December of 2017. As Dr. Zogby knows, most people don't read December uh, literature. It's uh, You all are a little bit busy, so I'm sure nobody knows this paper. Uh, I, I don't actually know if it's been cited, but it is a paper uh, from the American Heart Association. We try to identify standards for quality in cardiovascular imaging. As you can see, some of the single site centers series uh, can generally be small, and what we'd hope for is that we can provide you with a lot of randomized trial evidence establishing the relationship with any given modality in risk as well as with a clinical outcome. And there are a lot of examples of this all up and down this pyramid, and we're, I'm going to try to focus in on understanding the very high quality evidence. And, and you're going to see why and different pieces of evidence fit within this and how uh, we don't have a perfect example of, of everything that we would like to understand from a quality perspective in cardiovascular imaging. So this theoretical concept, and this I, this I believe is my second to last kind of above the clouds uh, kind of perspective, and then we'll get into some, some details of, of evidence. Um, but the theoretical concepts in risk-based decision-making is really reflective of what you do every day. As a research scientist, it is my goal to emulate your decision-making process and understand uh, the patient flow th work uh, flow through um, in, in your care patterns and to try to emulate that from a risk-based decision-making point of view. So you have some high-risk marker, and this is where um, uh, linking that high-risk markers to targeting effective care and that sufficient linking is the, the rate-limiting step to improving outcomes. All of you are sitting here thinking this makes so much sense, but I'll have to tell you from a clinical care point of view, this link right here is what we don't see when we look at large outcomes-based data. Less than half of patients who have moderate to severe ischemia on any kind of stress testing go to cath. Less than 10% of patients that have any ischemia on any stress test have new, any new or intensification of anti-ischemic therapies. So we haven't made that link. And even though this sounds so profoundly simple, it's something that we really lack. And what's happened in imaging is that there is clearly these silos of care. And the more we can integrate imaging, imaging data into guiding care, the more it will actually result in improving patient outcomes. That's not just for CT. So even though I'm giving you an example of CT, I hope you can see that what I'm trying to illustrate is the concept of actually risk-based decision-making and how you actually improve patient outcomes. So I'm going to focus in on the data with CT. I'm gonna uh, try to identify so, some novel pieces of information that I think CT provides to you, which is unique. That is non-obstructive coronary disease, identifying that in its prognostic significance. I'm gonna talk a lot about plaque because I think that is really a burgeoning area with CT. 
And I'm gonna uh, finish off my discussions on quantification of plaque, which I think is really a hot area of ongoing research, although it's extremely time consuming now. And you'll see when I explain it to you how we do it, at least at Cornell, how time consuming it is. And hopefully some machine learning and artificial intelligence, com some computer vision will really help to facilitate that. But I think that is really a, a key piece of future for uh, coronary CT. And then I'm gonna talk about the evidence with improving patient outcomes from a clinical trial point of view. So why CT? Why did I decide to use CT? Well, I think you can clearly see one of the reasons is this gamut of this spectrum of coronary disease, you know, from the very severe stenosis to the normal, and we'd all like to be in this. And it's not just normal. It's not just a normal test. It's no stenosis, no plaque. So I often hear people say, well, there wasn't any stenosis. We, one of the nice things about CT is we can actually put that patient in that normal category of no stenosis, no plaque. And one of the things that we talked about last night at dinner is just that CT, just in the last decade, has had a rapid acceleration of evidence. And there's just a whole lot of evidence across diverse patient cohorts. And I know, like all of you, if you're not in, into imaging, if you're not interested in CT or, or whatever, it's like for me in other areas, it's hard to keep up in really rapidly evolving areas. I know it is for me. So I'm going to try to highlight some of the specific evidence. And I know you're going to say, why is she going to a paper from 2007? Well, this is one of the first large uh, series which was published on prognosis. And what was interesting is when this was submitted to Jack, we had to really fight with the journal of calling it a stenosis. They didn't want to call it a stenosis. They wanted to call it plaque. So we've seen such a rapid evolution in thoughts and understanding of what CT has to offer. And of course, our standards were the invasive literature. Um, I, I actually have published on this. I spent uh, a large part of my early career at Duke. So this is the Duke CAD prognostic index. We revised it slightly, and of course, one of the nice things about understanding the invasive literature is that it applies, obviously, very nicely. We include proximal lesions as being more prognostically significant. We, we actually incorporate um, uh, proximal LAD disease, looking at left main. So you see this nice ability to risk stratify. A relatively small cohort of 1,000, it's nice for me to be able to say, a relatively small cohort. But since this first really large publication, tremendous amount of data has been published. The next thing that we did after this uh, Jack 2007 was to start the confirm registry, which Dr. Moaz al Mala was, was an active participant in with us, in which we uh, enrolled more than 32,000 patients from around the world. And this is continuing to evolve as we're starting on confirm two, which will be even longer follow-up sorry, and be even longer follow-up um, and um, a, a diverse, an even more diverse group of sites from around the world. And so the confirmed registry, one of the first papers that I think came out of this was this Jack 2011 paper, where now when we get a much larger cohort without any known coronary disease, we're able to ferret out some unique cohorts and show that non-obstructive disease in this population, that is any stenosis, any luminal stenosis, or any plaque, is associated with worsening outcomes when compared to normals. You can see some nice examples of the extremes of these types of patient cohorts. But in this case, in many cases in the invasive or in other types of angiographic literature in years past, we can lump that together. We lumped normal in less than 50% stenosis together, which was a huge mistake from a patient point of view. Now we're seeing many, many more papers understanding the role of non-obstructive disease as driving risks. And of course, we've known for so long that if a patient is, comes in with an ACS and they have a prior, any type of angiographic assessment, that culprit lesion is much more likely to be in a prior non-obstructive stenosis about two-thirds of the time. So understanding that predictive relationship in here Making that link to other evidence is fundamental for us to ferreting out. And this is what's unique about CT. I'm also going to share with you something unique about these lesions in terms of being ischemia producing, which I think is another piece of information that we can connect all these different modalities. And of course, this is not unique to 
understanding risk. And there was this nice paper which was published by Udo Hoffman in Circulation, which compared risk. It compared risk with functional testing. Uh, you can see here on the right, and CT. And, and on the CT side, this is normal coronaries. This is non-obstructive. This is single vessel disease, and this is multi-vessel disease. Now, this is a, a normal or mildly abnormal functional test. And this is a moderate and a severely abnormal test. But look at these two lines here. So all of you remember the concept of demand ischemia. So what we're looking at in a, for a stress test is functionally significant disease, correct? But we know that about half the time, any obstructive lesion is not going to be ischemia producing. So it's about half and half. So what we see here in, in this population is that the normal studies uh, did not clearly differentiate risk uh, as they did on the CT side. And it has to be that in this normal, this group of no, with normal stress tests, there had to be some cohort or subgroup of patients with obstructive disease that wasn't ischemia producing. But it's still associated with risk. It's still associated with progressive disease states. So clear separation in, this, in these two risk, risk groups is something that we have to be very cautious about in understanding the concept of demand ischemia, that it's not always going to, any kind of obstructive lesion is not always going to be ischemia producing. And this is one of the limitations of functional testing, is understanding that there, are, there is going to be disease which is missed in this concept. And you can see by the large number of patients combining these two groups together, it gives you about, about the same amount of patients. But wouldn't it be nice to know that whether or not they had disease but it was non-ischemic, whether they had disease when it was ischemic, because clearly there's some heterogeneity and risk in these populations. This isn't a criticism of functional testing. This is just the biology of what goes on with demand ischemia. So I think it's important for us to hearken back to those, our understandings of what it is to provoke ischemia. Also, it has to do with our patient populations, and oftentimes their inability to reach maximal levels of exercise, their inabilities uh, to, to actually provoke ischemia in, in large subgroups of the population, which um, I know when, when I was in Atlanta, roughly two-thirds of our patient population was obese. And getting them on the treadmill, getting them to do, getting them to provoke ischemia was is more than a challenge, um, as all of you I think are very very well aware. So understanding this limitation of functional testing is something which caused me to have a little bit of concern over the last uh, few years when I read this paper. Now the confirm registry also started to look at more longer term follow up as we started to feel more comfortable with understanding CT and its relationship with near-term prognosis, we started to get more and more longer-term follow-up. And here's just a, a paper which was published in Jack Imaging um, uh, by one of, uh, one of my fellows looking at longer-term follow-up. Again, establishing that predictive relationship with non-obstructive disease, both in women and men. So one of the things that is important is to validate early findings and more diverse cohorts. And this is what you see from this paper. One of my key uh, contributions that I'm still working on is understanding this whole concept of sex-based differences and whether or not there is a different biologic signature that we can see either in ischemic risk or in uh, pathobiologic risk or in anatomic risk. And this is just one piece of information that we see. And certainly, and for both women and men, non-obstructive disease is associated with a worsening prognosis and that normal coronaries are decidedly low risk, even in a symptomatic group. Of course, this has been shown. This, I'm just throwing this recent paper in from the Duke, uh, Duke Data Bank looking at risk in, in, from a, an elective invasive angiographic cohort. It's not just in, in CT. So everything we learn between invasive angiography and CT angiography, there are differences in the populations, absolutely. An invasive cohort is much older. It's much higher risk. But it does uh, provide you specifically with very similar pieces of information that we can learn from. And there have been papers similarly from the VA in terms of understanding non destructive risk um, in, in, in terms of the, uh, a VA largely male cohort. But interestingly enough, it's, we start to kind of think about non-obstructive disease, and we have to start to think about key patient subsets. Here's another paper from one of my fellows that we published in CERC Imaging, looking at death or MI in a non-obstructive left main. So obviously, subtending a large part of the myocardium, 
showing risk in, in those with a, a normal versus a non-obstructive left main. Of course, you would expect this, but it's nice to see this. We did some comparative analysis between women and men um, and, and showed that uh, women with a non-obstructive left main uh, disease had a much, much higher risk. Women have smaller arteries. Any type of non-obstructive disease generally encumbers a larger amount uh, of their epicardial coronary artery and therefore often imparts a, a greater degree of risk um, when compared to their male counterparts. So this is another piece of information uh, that we can see, particularly about high-risk disease. And in many cases, these high-risk disease subsets are, are often not annotated in clinical reports. So it's important to understand that non-obstructive disease. I'm going to transition now to, to speaking uh, about plaque in the first um, uh, piece of information I'd like to talk about is coronary artery calcium scoring, which I know you all use uh, a lot here. The calcium score um, is a very simple measure, Agatson score, the calcium score. It is a measure of the area of the plaque by the density of the plaque. It's a simple kind of measure, and I'm, but I think what you're going to see in, in terms of where calcium scoring is going, I'm trying to give a kind of prediction as well, is we need to know the location. You have a big chunk of calcium in the proximal LAD. That's a little bit different than if you have a mid-right coronary artery, a uh, big chunk of plaque. The shape of the plaque, we're getting a better idea of the eccentricity of the plaque, uh, imparts differential risk. The number of the diffusivity of the plaque, the number of vessels that are involved, the lesion size, you can get a lot of small lesions, and you can get a big, big chunk of calcium, the volume and the density of the plaque. And this is non-contrast, so these uh, densities are going to be quite different between contrast and non-contrast, as you'll see by an example. Now, what this paper that came, ag again, out of promise, was really fascinating. Many of you probably didn't read it because you said, oh, calcium scoring. But most of the early calcium work that was done was done at this institution by Dr. Mamarian. And a preamble to this paper was done by Dr. Moaz Al-Mala um, in the confirm registry. So this, a lot of this early work in this area came from this institution. But here's the data from PROMISE. Here's that same risk stratification with functional testing. Here's your ability to risk stratify with, calcium, with the calcium score. But what was fascinating, in a symptomatic de novo chest pain evaluation, 84% of the events, just think about this, 84% of the events occurred in people that had calcified plaque, whereas only 43% of, of, the, of the events occurred in people that had an abnormal functional test. If you want to know who's at risk in your symptomatic cohort, you want to know what their calcified plaque is, because almost all of the events, almost all of the risk is encumbered in that. To me, that's a very has very far-reaching implications as to who and how and what tests we should use, and this test I know, I realize everybody has, this seems to be advancing, that's okay. This seems to be, um, I know that everybody has a differential charge for this. Medicare charges are about $50 for this. Most places charge $100, $150, so it's not an expensive test. And we like to optimize the use of inexpensive tests. This also has far-reaching implications for those people that don't have any plaque. If you have a patient who has symptoms and they have no calcified plaque, that then we're, we're starting to embark on thoughts about deferring testing in that patient. I know this is heresy in cardiovascular medicine, but we, we have to start thinking about triaging some of these folks who don't benefit from a, additional testing and to consider deferring testing. Um, there's a new guideline being written on chest pain, and it's going to discuss deferring testing. Um, so I'm giving you a little bit of a preamble to that, those, some of those discussions in thinking about how that's going to evolve in, a, in terms of a new guideline. There's a, this is data, again, from, the, from a, a calcium consortium that I was involved with, where we looked at uh, this presence of detectable plaque risk. And this is 15-year follow-up. Um, and this is in 66,000 patients that we followed for over 10 years. And we can actually see the presence of detectable calcium associated with worsening prognosis in women. Again, arterial size plays a strong role in the, in, in the, when any plaque encumbers uh, um, a, a given um, amount of the myocardium for a woman versus a man. And we actually see that across the, the number of vessels with plaque, you can see an elevated risk. So as you get more extensive plaque, uh, you see accelerated risk in female populations. There are lots of phenotypes 
that we need to uncover, this is just one of them, that I think will be very helpful for you clinically. And in the US, we are getting a much more diverse population. And we need to know a lot more differences about racial and ethnic, as well as sex-related differences in our populations that we have just scratched the surface on. And I think this is just one of these pieces of information. The imaging literature is often not robust enough in terms of getting more detailed in terms of clinical phenotypes, but I think uh, we're, we're gonna change that with this confirmed two registry in terms of getting much more detail so we can get many more um, pieces of information like this and perhaps uh, give uh, plaque signatures, if you will, uh, to different subgroups of the population, young versus old, um, women, men, blacks, whites, et cetera, which I think will be very helpful for all of you clinically. Now, I want to shift to now this concept of plaque because this is really, uh, I've, I hate to say it's a hot area, because it, but it is. Um, and, and this concept of a lot of atherosclerotic plaque features like positive remodeling, this uh, low Hounsfield unit, or this dark plaque, um, which is lipid-rich plaque, um, and then we have this uh, concept of spotty calcification over here, smaller, less than three millimeter dots of calcification. This napkin ring sign, I don't know. I think it's, it's, this is a tough one. Maybe Moaz can talk about how often you see this. We don't see this very often, purely. But it is an area of variable densities, a ring around a, a, a darker intensity plaque that is signi sign supposed to signify a, a thin cap atheroma. Um, we'll see about this relationship in the ensuing slides, but a lot of these high-risk plaque features uh, have been undetected, but there's a wealth of evidence, as all of you know, in the invasive literature with IVIS, OCT, et cetera. Now, this is qualitative plaque assessment from PROMISE. This is from Marish Ferencheck from uh, Oregon Health Science Center, published in JAMA Cardiology. You can see that predictive risk, if you have any of these high-risk plaque features, this low attenuation plaque, this bulging positive remodeling, this napkin ring sign, any of those is associated with a worsening prognosis. And this is just over a short period of time. What is really fascinating is this high-risk plaque features were associated with um, uh, more predictive in the patient populations that had non-obstructive disease in the young in general, and particularly in women. So in populations with less extensive disease, these high-risk plaque features can be more helpful at identifying a unique subgroup of patients. This is fascinating, and this is all all of the data I'm going to show you about plaque has clearly just been in the last few years. Any of you who read the Scott Hart paper, which was published, now again, qualitative information about plaque, they threw everything I thought about plaque out the window, okay? So here you have adverse plaque, um, and it is qualitative, predictive of risk univariably, but when you risk adjust, it's no longer predictive. So everything I just told you could not, may or may not be true. And what was really fascinating is that when they put coronary calcium score into the model with these high-risk plaque features, the adverse plaque, the high-risk plaque, became non-significant. And the lone significant uh, predictor of outcome in Scott Hart was coronary calcium. This makes no sense to me, none. And I wrote the editorial about it. So the, the, what I do think it is reflective of is the calcium score is reflective of the total global burden of atherosclerosis. And um, in that these, this qualitative nature of looking at high-risk plaque has got to be something we've got to explore in more detail. So scratching my head over this, yes. What does this mean? I'm unsure. So this brings me to the concept of quantifying plaque. And this is where I think it gets very exciting. All of, um, a lot of my program, uh, research programs right now are looking at whole heart, three vessel quantification of plaque and characterization of the plaque. These are half a millimeter slices along the coronary artery that we measure. We actually measure the amount of plaque and as well as the type of plaque. Now you say, well, what does that mean? So it, one, what we're trying to develop is the three dimensionality of quantifying plaque. We're doing this across all major epicardial vessels and branches. These are half millimeter cross-sectional slices. 
to look at plaque and lumen. And get, you guessed it, this is time consuming. This is really time consuming. We need some artificial intelligence on this. There have been several very well done meta-analysis that have compared these results between CT and IVIS. This is really important. IVIS is the gold standard. Um, the largest, uh, it was a meta-analysis published in about almost 1,400 patients. There was about a difference of a millimeter, millimeter and a half cube, which is really small, between CT and IVIS. And the area under the plaque, uh, the, for plaque, total plaque volume between IVIS and CT was 0.97. So we're close. We're close. Uh, these measures are, are fairly concordant. All that red in there is very high-risk plaque in case the white is calcium. And the first one of the first projects that we did uh, was the ICONIC registry. We used CONFIRM and the CONFIRM registry, and we actually took patients that had an ACS, a confirmed ACS. We matched them to a patient population that did not have an ACS. We matched them by age, uh, the site, risk factors, and the severity of disease. So the only thing that would differ between these two groups is plaque. And what was interesting, this is what we found, and this is what is known, is that for the most part, those um, iconic culprit vessels were much more likely to be um, in a non-obstructive uh, stenosis or less than 50% stenosis. And this is what you expect. And this is what makes all of the plaque stuff, to me, very, very interesting, is that we're picking up a lower risk group, at least as you see it, at the time of documenting that less than 50% stenosis. And when we quantify the plaque, between a case and control, the ACS and the no ACS, we couldn't see any difference between the total plaque volume, the amount of calcified plaque volume, whether or not it was fibrous, but we actually do see differences in this kind of lower density side of the plaque. So this necrotic core, which is the lowest density, and then the next up is the next density. I'm going to show you some examples of this in a minute. We saw that the ACS groups had much more likely to have more fiber fatty and necrotic core plaque. Interesting findings. So this very low density, this very lipid-rich plaque um, is associated with ACS. Now this is more confirmative. This is like a prospect uh, validation in a CT cohort. Um, and our findings were similar uh, per patient or per vessel. The high-risk plaque features were all very different. Um, uh, it, whether or not you had two or more of these features was more likely in ACS, this low attenuation or this very low density plaque, positive remodeling, bulging out, this, uh, areas of small spotty calcification. All of these were much more likely to be in an ACS cohort than they were in a non-ACS cohort. So you say, okay, that's consistent with the ACS literature, but it's interesting because these were all done several years prior to the ACS. So we can identify these as predictors of ACS. Uh, this is one of the first papers that did this in this much detail. Certainly it requires a lot of validation. So let's look at a case, right? This is a patient, 52-year-old man with dyslipidemia. Um, and we can actually see this is an LAD artery. You can see in an orange, I'm not sure if this is orange or peach, it doesn't matter, and the lumen in the vessel wall. And what we see here is all four features. And here you can see this kind of uh, histogram, if you will. Here's the distance from the ostium. Here you can actually see the area. Here you can see this nice remodeling index. This is a, this is a huge bulging out. All this red, is the very, very low density necrotic core, and then the fiber fatty um, is, uh, is this lighter uh, green or yellowish green. And here you see, I don't know if this projects really well, so um, in, in terms of a contrast enhancement, this is less than 30 Hounsfield units, and this is 31 to 130. So all of this is associated with higher risk. So this patient had everything. And look what happened to them. Two days later, a STEMI. Um, and so we're seeing some of these, this aggressive um, progression of coronary disease in CT. I'm telling, this is at the tip of the iceberg, so don't take this as being anything that we can be definitive of, but it, we are seeing patterns of, of temporal instability when you see patient populations like this. But a lot of patients don't really have um, this clear-cut, uh, high-risk plaque features. Oftentimes they have a mixture of stable plaque you see that calcified plaque in there, the greener plaque, uh, the, the more fibrous plaque. Um, and then you get so, uh, combinations of positive remodeling and necrotic core, and maybe not a near-term instability, 
uh, but uh, a month later, a non-STEMI. So we, we can see some nice illustration of cases of the patient populations and their risk, and putting this together, it does create a pattern uh, that these features can be very helpful in terms of identifying risk. Of course, what you want to do, though, is you want to treat that risk. You want to know, can I do something about that plaque? Well, calcified plaque, maybe not so much, but certainly our big target and what an ongoing area of research is shrinking the non-calcified plaque. I know uh, John Mamarian and, and Moaz Al-Mala and I talked, we talked last night along with Bill about this is kind of a target for us. This is uh, the paradigm study which we published last year. Um, it is not a trial. So you can, we did paired CT studies. Patients were statin naive, and, and then they initiated statins following the index scan. And what we saw in this uh, patient population of around 1,200 patients is we saw a roughly 23% increase in calcified plaque, i.e. the body trying to heal that uh, non-calcified plaque, solidify that plaque, creating um, uh, some form of, of, of strengthening of that plaque, but a huge reduction in non-calcified plaque burden uh, for those patients that were, were, had initiation of statin therapy. This is not definitive because it's not a trial, but there, this is not the only paper that has shown this association. What was also interesting is that, that we actually saw in the statin-taking patients a 35% decrease in the incidence of new high-risk plaque features in that second scan when compared to the statin-naive. So as we start to and, 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 and embark on some of the randomized trial evidence, I think we can think about areas where quantification of plaque can be very helpful. Now, most of you know these, these first couple slides I'm going to go through rather quickly because they didn't really show a difference in outcome. Here's Promise. Who hasn't read Promise here? Randomization of 10,000 patients to CTA versus functional testing. Really a low-risk cohort, right? 78% atypical symptoms, only 12% with typical angina. Here's your admixture of stress testing. Look at the prevalence of obstructive disease and the event rates really low. I think Promise hit too low of a risk population. Compared this to Scott Hart, Look at scarred heart, much more typical of what we see, a very high prevalence of obstructive disease. I'm not sure we get that in the US. This is Scotland, where they have higher risk. And borderline p-values uh, for the, the main trial results. But what's happened more recently? Well, we, in, in New England Journal in August, if you were on vacation, you might have missed this in August. But here's the five-year outcomes. This was a planned analysis. If you go back to their, their, their trial design paper, it's a planned analysis. So you can actually see at five years, significant improvement in outcomes in the CT-based trial. Now, I think that any, any test could achieve this. But what we're seeing is that CT is much more effective at guiding preventive care. And even in promise, CT was associated with higher use of antiplatelets, statin, ACE, beta blockers, et cetera. Here's just two illustrative examples of the higher use, not higher use at baseline, but higher use across the years, antiplatelet therapy, statins. I couldn't fit all the drugs on here, the drug classes, but it's a consistent measure. The question that you have for yourself is can this 10% or so difference actually drive this improvement in outcome? That's the leap of faith you have to make. But it does say, very interestingly enough, is what the investigators did was that they actually prompted care, of, of, they prompted the patient, the physician, to prescribe uh, preventive therapies for those with non-obstructive and obstructive disease. So even though this was a pragmatic trial, there was some initiation of guiding care, which I think is the, the problem with the PROMISE trials, is we need to, and the problem with part of it with the Scott Heart, is we need to be much more prescriptive in our clinical trials to guide clinical care and to make that link. And if we make that link, potentially we improve outcomes. Now, all of you are going to, if you're up on your literature uh, from last week in Jack, um, I'm probably not supposed to say this, but I reviewed this paper uh, four times uh, for Jack. This is from Promise. This looks at patients with diabetes here uh, and not diabetes and shows that patients that were randomized to, to CTA had a lower um, risk at, at uh, it's actually around 26 months versus when they were diabetic as compared to, uh, not, uh, to patients randomized to functional testing. No such difference were shown in the non-diabetic population. This paper has received tremendous amount of criticism. I include it 
because I think it's, it's something that you can't ignore. It was a planned analysis. It was not, and so it's, it's important for a clinical trial when you planned subgroup. This wasn't some spurious finding. They went off and did, you know, uh, five fellows went off and did a subgroup analysis and f 45 people, uh, 45 subgroups and found this. This was planned. Um, and it's intriguing to, for me. Uh, one of the things that I question on this side, uh, on this side, is the extent to which the diabetics really did have a good functional test, whether or not they were able to get um, a good exercise capacity, or whether or not uh, you know they were all they were obese and had any imaging artifact, breast tissue artifact on the nuclear, et cetera, which could create uh, this opportunity. So, is it that the CT is better, or is it that in this population functional testing may not be as good? We can, I can criticize this paper, and it has received a tremendous amount of criticism um, in social media for whatever that's worth. Um, but uh, I do think it is intriguing, and it does fit into kind of our mindset of what's going on. And, and do we re need to rethink what our first line test is? So one of the problems that we've seen with CTA is this higher use of invasive angiography, and in some cases, higher use of revascularization. And we have no earthly idea from the trials. This is a huge problem. We have no earthly idea if that cath use is appropriate or if it's ischemia guided. So Scott Hart showed a borderline increase. Promise showed a big increase in the use of invasive angiography. It's possible, possible that there is a prompt detection of those high risks at anatomic subgroups like left main, triple vessel disease, which would explain some of this. That would explain some of the prompt use of invasive angiography, but we, that's just my guess. So it would be nice to see data. I'm a data person. And what I think we're getting, this is how I think about all of this, is what we're starting to see is to think, of, for, I'm starting to think about, is this interactive relationship between plaque, stenosis, and ischemia. And we do go down in terms of understanding. This is broadly what is going on with patients. This is this primary disease process, which is impacting roughly 65 to 70% of the symptomatic patients have some form of atherosclerosis, based upon what we see. That might be a little high, but based upon that. A smaller number have stenosis, obviously, in terms of disease process. But realize it is a much smaller number and an even smaller number have this tertiary physiologic response. Understanding, to me, this is where, I, this is a, a figure that I've worked on very hard, is to understand all of this relationship because it's all interconnected. And, and I think we, we really can find this synergy between functional testing and anatomic testing, um, as well as guiding prevention globally in a patient population, improving outcomes if we understand this, this kind of interactive relationship. And I'd like to share with you a, pay, a, a trial that we're finishing as right now called Credence. Um, and what we did was, it's a con controlled clinical trial. This trial was a bear. Um, we did uh, myocardial perfusion imaging in around 600 patients. It could be SPECT, PET, or CMR, and CT angiography. And they all had three-vessel invasive FFR. So don't ask me the radiation exposure. I'm, it's, I'm, I'm not, I, I was shocked. I would never have done the trial if I had known that. So 618 patients. Um, and so what, we are, what the goal was is to look at the relationship between all of these predictors and invasive FFR. At vessel specific ischemia. Now we had to. We're not saying a, a, a lesion specific ischemia. Vessel specific ischemia, because a lot of the patients wouldn't have coronary disease, uh, didn't have obstructive coronary disease. Here's the CT side. We looked at stenosis severity. Obviously, highly predictive of, of lesion specific ischemia. Uh, we added on a lot of plaque features. We saw a significant improvement in understanding uh, the presence, uh, the likelihood of invasive ischemia. Uh, as well as when we added a fractional flow reserve with CT, no improvement in outcome. Um, and I think that is likely because this is provoking this, and once we put this in the model, there's no need for that physiologic response, and it's too expensive anyway. But I know you guys use it, so. Um, here's our best performing model. These sequential lesions, non-calcified plaque volume, high-risk plaque features, and lumen volume. So let me just uh, share with you, this is comparing, so CT angiography did a better job 
at understanding risk associated with lesion speci of, uh, lesion spe vessel specific ischemia uh, in terms of invasive FFR as compared to perfusion imaging. We use state of the art perfusion imaging, but I think there's just much more detail that we can we can garner with CT that drives that better prediction model. So let's just look at some of these features. So we have stenosis severity of our take home features. These kind of uh, these serial uh, lesions, which we quite frankly often see, you know, distal to that third lesion, even though they're mild, uh, that's going to be ischemic or more often ischemic. Interestingly enough, this non-calcified plaque volume seems to be more ischemic. This is not this is not the first paper to show that. This is about the sixth or seventh paper to show that. One of the interesting findings, though, was this concept of lumen volume. And the lumen, the smaller the lumen volume, no surprise there, the more often ischemic. Um, and I think this is something we have to really start to think about and from a CT perspective is this concept of what's going on with lumen volume. How big is it? Because you can get, you, you all have seen this, small lumens, large lumens. You have a large lumen, less ischemia. Um, but it also has to do with the size of the lumen in relation to the subtended myocardial mass. So that's one of the areas that we're working on right now, is to try to find a quick way of, uh, of kind of quantifying the mass that's subtending. And I think that composition of lumen volume along with myocardial, subtended myocardial mass could be very helpful in understanding ischemic burden. And then as well, uh, this high-risk plaque features. So what's interesting about this, if you take this and you say, okay, uh, obstructive disease that predicts risk. But look at all these others. These are all, can, can largely be the non-obstructives. Because this is what you're seeing, right? This is how we've been fooled in cardiovascular medicine for so long. We've been fooled in, in, in saying a non-obstructive, person who has ischemia, they go to the cath lab and they have non-obstructive disease, it's not ischemia. I think we're seeing, in many cases, ischemia here, small lumen volume, ischemia here, a lot of diffuse plaque, ischemia here, and with high-risk plaque features, ischemia, even absent a, a significant lesion. I think our evolving understanding of non-obstructive ischemia is going gonna, is gonna to change quite dramatically over the next few years and be very helpful for us. That's not to say they belong in the cath lab because there's not a whole lot you can do about it, but it can actually prompt us general consideration with treatment strategies, obviously not necessarily here, but certainly here, certainly here. Um, and certainly preventive strategies in this patient population. Of course, this is not the only answer. I don't think that the Credence trial is the only answer. You, here you see the, the Pacific trial showing um, that PET coronary flow reserve was highly predictive of three-vessel FFR, much more so than, than spec perfusion imaging or CT and, and uh, angiography stenosis. And I think we're going to see more data out, that, out, out like this showing the role of coronary flow reserve particularly from this institution, can be leaders in understanding hyperemic flow with PET in its relationship to invasive FFR. So a little bit of twists and turns in our understanding and thought-provoking research in terms of where we're going um, in terms of understanding atherosclerotic plaque. I think it does beg for us to consider whether it's time for a change in our diagnostic evaluation. Uh, we certainly see this is from 2012. This is being under it's being revised as we speak. I'm chairing the section on the cardiac imaging section. All of this is written. It's being finalized as we speak. It's going out for review soon. Hopefully, AHA 2019. This is going to look very differently. And of course, does this does this understanding that we can detect plaque and perhaps do a better job of understanding ischemia? Does it make us think about whether or not some form of anatomic test, some form of anatomic test, whether it be calcium scoring or whether it be CT angiography, should be performed first, as is recommended within the, the UK, National Institute of Clinical and Healthcare Excellence, or, or and then followed by selective functional testing? Does that make us consider that? I don't know. In certain, pop, in certain times, I think there's certainly compelling evidence which makes me think that in many cases, some we have to have a different diagnostic evaluation algorithm. So I want to thank you uh, for your really great um, listening, and thank you for spending your, your early morning with me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Leslie. Really fascinating. 
changing paradigm, I think, for coronary disease from the percent stenosis to so many other, so many other things. Questions? Thanks for a great grand round. Um, so have we reached a point where calcium score must be integrated with functional testing to, for functional testing to survive, or otherwise we're gonna move on to anatomical testing? I hope, it, I hope it survives, for one. I mean, that's been most of your and my career, uh, <laughs> like not thrown away. Um, and you know, we still have the ischemia trial, which um, I'm hoping is gonna look at the role of moderate to severe ischemia. You know, I think for so many reasons, a calcium score should be added. One, it's inexpensive, it's easy to measure, can be measured everywhere. You don't actually have to do, you don't have to have hybrid equipment, you can do it separate from the test. And I think it, it can give you, just in terms of interpretation, if you know, if you have a, you know, questionable ischemia, but you know there's a big chunk of calcium in that vascular territory, you have a lot more confidence and diagnostic certainty in making that interpretation. For that reason alone, for those reasons alone, I think it should be. I actually think it should be in everybody, personally. Even with an exercise ECG alone, I think those two combinations could be quite powerful. Thank so. you for a great talk. My, my question is also about the calcium score. So it's clear that a, a calcium score of zero is very helpful, and, but it seems like a little under 50% of patients will have that. So for those that have a high calcium score, how do you further risk stratify them? I see some people with a very high score are getting, you know, in the community, they're put on statins, are getting serial calcium scores over the years. Is that useful? Or are there, is there a certain threshold of calcium score that you might want to do some functional testing? You know, the, the functional, um, I'll get to the functional testing. There, about 2002 to 2007, there were a ton of papers, include, I, we had some as well, looking at the relationship between the, the extent of coronary calcium and inducible ischemia. And even in the calcium scores of 400 or higher, only about 15, 20% of patients will have inducible ischemia. So there's just not that gradation. So a functional test after a high-risk calcium score, I'm sure, I'm sure there will be clinical reasons that you can think of your own mind, depending if the patient's symptomatic or whatever way you'd want to do a functional test. But in many cases, in the people with high-risk calcium, um, what you're concerned about is whether or not that is the iceberg above the water, and there's a whole burden of non-calcified plaque, which is in, can be called actionable, if you will, and we can potentially, potentially shrink that with, with aggressive uh, lipid-lowering therapies. So most of the time, you would we'd not want to follow somebody who has any kind of si significant calcium with a cal another calcium score. I know there have been papers to that, but it doesn't make sense clinically because you know so they'll progress. Yeah, they they progress. They'll get a, they, it'll go up yeah, for the most part. And do should we and even, with statin, and even with statin therapies they'll go up and and obviously from the paradigm. But I think you'd want to follow that up with a CT angiogram and un understand this no burden of non-calcified plaque. And then I think you know and obviously making sure we I didn't talk about radiation exposure. Making sure this is all done with as low as reasonably achievable couple millisieverts, which I know they do here quite well. Um, so follow it up with a CT. Um, I think is a better is a better choice. Um, thank you so much. Um, quick question. Are we ready to use calcium score as a gatekeeper to nuclear stress testing? Well, are we ready? I mean, is the field ready? The answer is no. The field's not ready for that. But um, I, I do think you're increasingly getting, a, I think in the last 18 months, you know, with the guideline that was published just recently on cholesterol management, you saw a much greater uh, embracing of the calcium scoring uh, literature as compared to the prior gu guideline, which was not at all receptive of that huge body of evidence. So this receptivity and understanding how it fits into preventive cardiology, I think, is going to spurn people. I think the, for imagers, particularly in these diagnostic cohorts, there has to be a very strong link to what you do from a diagnostic point of view to preventive care. Preventive care. And that's where calcium scoring fits very nicely into that whole algorithm that's in that recent uh, Grundy um, guideline um, about using calcium scoring um, to either de-risk that patient, uh, that lower risk with somebody with no calcified plaque, or intensifying care in somebody with a calcium score of like 100 or higher. Um, those patients um, likely have a burden of non-calcified plaque. So the, the nuclear folks, um, part of the problem is, is that I see the 3,700 nuclear labs in the United States is often focusing on volume, not this institution, but many times focusing on volume, and they have efficient pathways of testing, 
And what you're saying to me is, can I change that pathway? And that's extremely difficult to do. Um, I've, the clinical practice guideline is going to make recommendations about the use of calcium scoring. I think it makes so much sense to add that for patient care and understanding of their ischemic risk and its minimal cost. I hope that many more people embrace it. I hope. Any so other right, questions? right now it's a standard of practice when you report the calcium score, you put a recommendation of risk stratification or management or intensification of therapy. Do you think we're ready or we have enough data while reading a CTA as imagers? Can we say if there's non-obstructive CAD to intensify treatment or comment on that, which I don't see as a standard of practice right now? You know, this is interesting because, uh, you know, I understand your point of saying that, you know, we don't have anything to do. We, we don't really have any trial evidence to base all of this on. But the patients have atherosclerosis. They have the disease. So um, thinking about prevention in that group um, is something which obviously should be at the forefront, forefront of your, your thoughts and ideas. So the question you have is, you see patients, do I wait for that randomized trial or do I embark on something that's reasonable? And I think we owe it to our patients to embark on something that's reasonable um, in lieu of clinical trial evidence. We're not doing anything that's kind of out there. We're just saying, you know, let's just target those patients with atherosclerosis um, and, and, and initiate and intensify preventive care in those patients. It's, it's standard of care approaches in an expanded population. Uh, it's reasonable, and in lieu of that, I think it's fair to our patients to do that. Last question. Thank you so much for your lecture. The issue with not having randomized trials, we always thought that viability prior to revascularization will improve outcomes, and meta-analyses and observational studies have shown that, but unfortunately, when it was tested in a real RCT, two studies in PET and in um, STITCH did not show that. So the other question when it comes to calcium scoring and in CTA, the problem is almost most of the studies are observational. And if we're saying people who have zero calcium score take away the statin, which has been proven in multiple randomized trials, including in primary prevention, that might be a little bit of a debatable thing among the medical community. The other thing is as simple as aspirin, as primary prevention. Two randomized trials show that it didn't work in diabetic patients, including high risk. So what is your point on not having enough data to kind of change practice um, in that regard, no, especially for primary prevention? You know, and this is, the, the, your, your point is unbelievably important. Um, and my opinion uh, with regards to that is there's been more receptivity of understanding that somebody without atherosclerosis is different than somebody with. That's the first and foremost on that. Um, and then the second part of, of your statement about we being fooled by randomized trials is we have to be a whole lot smarter in how we do randomized trials. We, we, we do, we've done these pragmatic designs, stitch, and pragmatic means is you just you randomize people and you just allow everything to happen. It doesn't work that way. I don't know if you you got you guys get referrals and you see how the how different practices patterns go out in the real world. We've got to do a, a smarter job of saying I'm going to test a strategy of care that may be image guided or maybe whatever. It has got to be somewhat dictated. It can't be you know, hamstringing you to doing X, Y, and Z on day 32 and then day 33. It can't be that. But we, those, many of the trial designs, and I'm not throwing away what you said, I mean, because I worked on the Courage trial. I worked on Barry 2D. I'm, wor I'm working on ischemia. I know the mistakes that we made by not being more prescriptive in terms of guiding care and how that impacted. I think our trial designs have to really help you say, this is the strategy I'm going to embark on. And if it's negative, it's negative. But how, when's the last time you saw a really good, helpful, positive trial? Scott Hart. But, but it, was after, it was not the primary results. It was not the primary. It was the secondary paper. So they, even they made mistakes. Why didn't they be more you know, controlling of, of care in that patient? So I just think we have to be, we have to provide information that helps you take care of people. Just randomization to CT, what does that help you with? It helps you make a decision, but it doesn't help you with knowing what to do with the results. And so I think that's where I think and we're stuck. a lot of variability, then, then you can't come up with any, any conclusions. Leslie, that was phenomenal, enlightening, and it's great to have you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amazing. <laughs>
Can I ask the uh, full-time faculty and the fellows to go in the direction of the Research Institute for our annual photo shoot? Oh, you were not here. I didn't realize the talk was here until then. Oh, okay. Just to keep that busy. Okay. 